right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. I'm Sarah Hawley. I'm the faculty lead for the education and training initiatives within IHPI. We're really excited today to have a long awaited presentation from Dr. Englesby um, focusing on how the CQIs can partner with you for your research. Um, I think probably many of you know Dr. Englesby, but he is a professor of surgery at Michigan Medicine um, in the section of transplantation surgery, and he practices transplantation in children and adults. Um, as we, many of us know, he's the portfolio director for the CQI initiatives, which are supported by Blue Cross Blue Shield in Michigan. So his primary interest is in surgery and population health, and he has considerable funding for his work from the NIH. Um, and he is going to talk with us today and many other accomplishments that I won't uh, go into fully today, but um, I know that this has been a long awaited presentation, um, so much interest in the CQIs and we are just thrilled to have you Mike presenting about how CQIs can partner with you, with us for our research. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you so much. Uh, great, thank you, Dr. Holly. Uh, someone give me a thumbs up, can you hear me? Yep, perfect. Awesome. I want to thank uh, the Dr. Holly team, IHPI, um, for the invitation. I want to thank Jamie Myers, who's the CQI um, communications manager, for helping me kind of put this talk together and just kind of keeping me on task. Hopefully, it's useful. I think I'll probably talk for like 25 minutes, 30 minutes, um, and then uh, do questions. Uh, my hope would be that you would leave the talk with maybe an idea um that you could bring to one of the cqi kind of program directors on a potential partnership and i'll um kind of just give you the lay of the land with how um how kind of the cqi is like what their structure is and advice on how to partner so um so the cqis essentially the way i explain them are the following about 25 years ago blue cross got this idea that they wanted to influence care that physicians and hospitals gave, but they realized that they couldn't really, they didn't have many levers to pull to change care. So they partnered with the, a bunch of interventional cardiologists here at the University of Michigan. Um, and that led to essentially a model called the, the CQIs or the, the collaborative quality improvement kind of programs. And essentially Blue Cross has outsource their quality improvement and their value um, uh, uh, agenda to the physician community uh, in the state of Michigan. And many of us within IHPI kind of run that um, program and I'm one of those individuals. Um, so, uh, and our goal is really to deliver high value um, change that improves the overall health of Michigan. And, um, and I'll kind of talk a little bit about how we do our work. So you can think of the CQIs as 24 kind of separate kind of statewide specialty based clinical registries. So we collect a lot of data, a lot of detailed data on people who get healthcare in the state of Michigan. We analyze the data, we identify high performance and we kind of prescribe or suggest kind of best practices. And we do that in an iterative fashion. And every year each CQI comes up with a bunch of kind of goals to try to drive kind of best care across the state of Michigan. And this kind of process has been refined over time. And it takes, you know, a lot of kind of cultural buy-in, a lot of community, a lot of great leadership um, among the physician community and the hospital community in Michigan. And we do good work. The other thing we do is we kind of kick the tires. We kick the tires at the hospitals uh, throughout the state and we kick the tires within the kind of physician kind of organizations. So um, what does that mean? Really the foundation of this is trust and community and um, the reality that if you're a, let's say a thoracic surgeon, you really are only going to listen to another thoracic surgeon about improving or changing your thoracic surgical care. So kind of change has to happen, kind of boots on the ground, it has to happen within. And in order for that to happen, the physician community must trust each other, they must know each other, and they must um, kind of uh, 
have a common goal of taking the best care possible of their patients. And people think kind of healthcare is a very uh, uh, competitive kind of environment. And I think it is in the boardroom, but it is not physician to physician, nurse to nurse. The, the discussion is pretty much always about um, kind of improving patients' lives. So, and the system freaking works, man. Like healthcare in Michigan is great. We're not in the business of, you know, systematically comparing ourselves to other um, kind of states, so to speak. But nonetheless, we are in the business of explaining our value proposition. There's a couple other models like this in other states, but none nearly as robust as we have in the state of Michigan. Um, and this is just a slide that I, I like uh, to re reflect upon. So this is kind of 25 states from RAND report came out, I think in 2000 and 19 data data is from 2017. And over here, you see kind of the, the um, private payer kind of payment or prices um, for both hospital and physician-based care. Um, so if Medicare pays a dollar, uh, you know, 1.5 would be, you know, um, private payer would pay a dollar 50. So you can see here in Michigan that kind of the prices, so to speak, are about a dollar 60 or, you know, kind of 160% of the Medicare rate. And you can kind of see other states, even states that are joining us where it's almost twice as high. So this translates, this is above my pay grade to really understand the implications of this. But I think it's fair to say that care in Michigan is um, relatively inexpensive and um, it's high quality. So there are 24 CQI programs and these are the list. And they really started BMC2, the numbers, the second one on this list, kind of is where it all started 25 years ago. It has grown kind of from there. We just added three or four in the last year. Um, and Blue Cross sees this as a way that they can achieve their ambitious goals of making Michigan kind of the healthiest place in the country and saving their clients, their purchasers, people who buy healthcare money. So, um, and as you, the CQIs kind of grew up in kind of the, the episode-based care world or, you know, procedure-based care, you know, interventional cardiology, surgical events, but there, that is changing and we're working more and more and growing interest in kind of longitudinal care of people with chronic disease. So you can kind of see these are different specialties and it ranges from, you know, very specific, like MACI um, is about essentially anticoagulation management. Um, to other ones that are more general. So the MSQC kind of encompasses kind of surgery in general, general surgery, gynecologic surgery, even some vascular surgery, acute care surgery, things like that. Um, so, and some are reasonably, you know, have five or 10 staff, some have 25 staff. So, so the CQIs, not only do they kind of try to drive high quality care, but essentially we kind of judge the physician and the hospital community on two Blue Cross and Center programs, pay for performance and value-based reimbursement. So essentially hospitals have a uh, certain amount of money at risk and across the CQI portfolio, we identify goals of, K of high performance and we essentially give a scorecard to Blue Cross. Blue Cross does not do any of this on their own. We, do, we, set, we set the agenda, we do the math, and then we tell Blue Cross kind of um, what the incentives are. So pay for performance is hospital incentive. And it's a, it's a lot of revenue for a hospital. So hospitals pay attention. And the value-based reimbursement program is on the physician side. So summary on kind of the CQI's infrastructure. We're essentially registry-based. Um, there are a lot of people who work on them. So almost 300 human beings and annual budget of about $40 million just for the Michi University of Michigan coordinating centers. In addition, we have about 650 full-time nurses that live at these other hospitals. They don't work at Michigan Medicine. They'll work at like, let's say a partnering hospital is Munson Hospital. Um, so there are Blue Cross funds nurses who do kind of registry-based data abstraction at these sites. Um, pretty much every hospital and most of the physician groups in the state are involved. Um, we kind of administer their value-based reimbursement programs and people do research on this platform. When they say they do research, they use the platform to do work. So 2020, about hundred papers used uh, the CQI platform. And currently there's about $50 million of extramural funding that in one way, shape or form engaged. It could just be one little aim of a big grant or it could be the entire grant is about kind of using the, the um, portfolio. And I'll explain that in more detail. 
So how do we do our QI work? Well, this is surgical site infection in the state of Michigan. This is like, let's say you're a physician at hospital X. This is your hospital. These, these, pay, these hospitals have kind of a higher surgical site infection rate. These hospitals have a lower surgical site infection rate. We're good at math. We're good at risk adjustment. Um, and we kind of ask these hospitals down here, say, hey, you are high performance performers for the state. Can you please explain to all of us um, how you achieve these outcomes? And then we even sometimes have some of these high performers go to these low performing hospitals and help them kind of boots on the ground, kind of do academic detailing to try to improve outcomes. It's kind of how we work in aggregate. I'm just going to highlight four or five of the CQIs because it's really important that you understand that um, they are um, completely different. If you know one, you know some, another one, you don't really know another one. So they have, you know, kind of the way like Mississippi and Vermont don't have a lot in common as states, but they're all states. Um, there's a lot of differences across them and their data and their culture and their kind of like ability to, to use, be used as a platform for research. Um, so anyway, a couple highlights. So the um, MST CVS is cardiothoracic cardiac and thoracic surgery, a remarkable group. And they really uh, were born out of, a, uh, of the, Michigan, uh, yeah, the Michigan chapter of the Mary Society Thoracic Surgeons, maybe getting the, AS, the STS, Society Thoracic Surgeons. So they were a statewide chapter that Society Thoracic Surgeons has a very robust national quality improvement program with a national registry. Really, they're the pioneers in this work. Um, and Michigan kind of lives in that space, but they also have a Michigan-specific um, program. And, you know, cardiac surgery in the state of Michigan is, is second to none because of the great work that happens within this group. But I think it's important to understand that for this group, they're part of a national organization. So for example, hey, can we have all your data it can be pretty complicated. Um, and uh, that having said, they have national benchmarking. So you can look at Michigan compared to other the rest of the state. So Donnie Lukoski, who's a IHPI, a very established investigator, has done a lot of great work. And Dr. Preger runs the MST CVS. So um, Donnie might be a point of contact if you're interested. This is from BMC2. So BMC2 uh, engages uh, in um, a peripheral PCI, whatever that stands for, um, coronary angioplasty, vascular surgery, and structural heart disease. So three kind of whole domains. It's the largest CQI. Um, and I think it's really, you know, this is, uh, work from kind of Peter Henke. I, I'm always inspired because there's national benchmarking showing that Michigan, you know, kind of has the highest rates of antiplatelet and statin kind of um, prescribing at discharge after kind of vascular surgery. But the point of this is, you know, there are national, there's, there's, a, a, there's a national trial, developed guidelines, and you kind of think that some of these surgical CQIs are about the technical aspects of surgery, but really this is about kind of preventing kind of, um, this is about preventative uh, kind of care um, so there's a lot of innovation that happens across these CQIs and showing that they're, they're, um, they try to kind of make sure that patients kind of hit guidelines. Another CQI is music. Music has been around for since 2012, so almost 10 years. Um, and music uh, focuses on um, neurologic care. And see their goal, their kind of statement is making Michigan number one in neurologic care. And I, I have no doubt it is. Music is a remarkable um, organization. And I think it kind of goes to show they started off relatively modestly by looking at, you know, uh, prostate biopsy antibiotic pathways. And over time, they have grown and they have really kind of set a standard, not only um, in the United States, but for all of our CQIs for innovation. So, you know, starting to review kind of videos of surgery, kind of really innovative stuff, having kind of technical skills workshops, Working on things like active surveillance isn't something that you would think that a bunch of surgeons would get excited about, but um, doing kind of shared decision-making. They've run a randomized trial. Um, yeah, I don't know. I forget what it was about, but throughout their portfolio. So um, they have kind of footprint in the mass, vast majority of urologic practices in the state. And it kind of goes on. They're expanding into you know, kidney stone surgery and other, uh, and actually expanding outside of the state of Michigan. So music um, is a remarkable um, organization. I have two more, I think, to highlight. So this is uh, HMS, Hospital Medicine. I, I, I forget exactly what it stands for, but their, their focus is inpatient hospitalization. Scott Flanders runs this, Elizabeth McLaughlin is the manager. And um, it, I, this is just essentially, they, when COVID hit, they essentially made a 180 degree pivot 
and they reorganized much of their day-to-day -day work to focus on COVID admissions in the state of Michigan. And in you know, just a matter of weeks, they established kind of statewide COVID registry that followed very detailed kind of clinical outcomes on admitted COVID patients. And as you can imagine, the impact of this, not only in Michigan, but nationally and academically, um, it kind of shows what a remarkable resource um, these can be for people in the state of Michigan and uh, kind of how kind of really uh, these organizations can um, pivot quickly to fill important needs. I want to talk about Aspire, it's the anesthesia registry. So Aspire is uh, a very complicated organization. So Nirav Shaw, Sasha and Ketapal run Aspire and they have 26 sites in the state of Michigan. But the, that, that, that is technically Aspire, but Aspire is kind of like nestled within um, I call it Sachin's kingdom, but MPOG, and MPOG is a, is a national organization that includes the you know many of the large academic um, medical centers in the state of Michigan, and uh, and they have um, a remarkable kind of data infrastructure um, around you know, kind of interoperative kind of events, and they have had they've been very successful not only improving care in the state of Michigan and across the uh, anesthesia in the United States, but they have. Um, a lot of um, um, uh, infrastructure to do national level kind of trials and intervention-based trials. Sachin um, has just gotten funding for one of those um, from Pokori. So it's a remarkable kind of community. But I think it's important to understand that I don't know how many people work in MPOG, but I'm guessing hundreds. And so you can't just kind of like knock on the door and be like, hey, can I have your data? There is a process. And these are, um, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the Michigan Valley Collaborative I think is um, uh, different than many of the other collaboratives because most of these collaboratives are based in some specialty so that you know all the bariatric surgeons, for example, in the state kind of come to a meeting. The Michigan Valley Collaborative is a bit different. Um, it really, their target audience is, is institutional leadership and they really focus on um, kind of improving value of care across the state of Michigan. And they have a remarkable database of Blue Cross Medicare Medicaid recipients in the state. And they really have a, a bird's eye view on the vast majority of healthcare that happens in the state of Michigan. Um, and they, um, they have their own initiatives and they also really partner with, um, you know, almost all the other CQIs to help us kind of understand how quality initiatives affect cost. Um, and uh, so they're a bit of a, a different type of registry a different type of collaborative, but remarkably effective. And then I want to talk a little bit about MShield. So um, it became clear probably to many of you like 25 years ago, but I think to some of us in the CQI leadership, how, um, what a gap there was in the work we had been doing around health equity. And, um, and just about a year ago, we, uh, we started MShield. So Renu, Tipperniti, John Scott run MShield. Um, and MShield is about essentially using this remarkable platform to try to drive health equity agenda for the state of Michigan. And they focus on obviously awareness, impact, and integration. In addition, and some of these CQI uh, have direct partnerships with Medicaid, MShield is, is kind of one of them. And, um, and, the Medi and they fund five of these kind of community health innovation regions um, to actually deliver social care to at-risk patients. So in a perfect world, the CQIs would really teach physicians like me, I'm a surgeon, to not just diagnose and write a prescription, but really to maybe potentially diagnose social risk and be able to write a prescription for some social resource. And MShield's goal is to try to bring that to um, across the entire state of Michigan. They just started a year ago. Remarkable group. Um, and uh, many great partnerships across the state. I'll skip that slide. Um, so anyway, that's just a couple of the CQIs. I think you can see how uh, different they all are. Um, and then here's some advice. So let's say I'm a researcher and be like, I'd love to, I don't really understand these CQIs. I'd love to, I got some ideas. I'm really interested in um, whatever, high value care and how would I partner? Um, first of all, uh, you know, the CQIs essentially are for quality improvement, and there's a pretty big gap between um, the research mindset and the QI mindset. And um, researchers seek truth, 
you know, quality improvement organizations are essentially businesses that improve care. And um, you have to have that uh, in mind when you go and seek partnership. So, um, uh, and people conflate quality improvement and research every day because the tools are kind of the same and the humans are the same. There's times when I'm doing research, there's times when I'm doing quality improvement. But for the organizations, they are essentially funded and they have a contract to do quality improvement. So you just have to be kind of aware of that. I'll talk a little bit more about that because that is by far the most common stumbling block to partner with the, with the CQIs, the IC researchers kind of face. Um, another kind of piece of advice for you as a researcher is um, we kind of have a general policy around, you can't just admire the problem. So perfect example would be I'm interested in at-risk populations in Michigan and their access to cancer care. It's like, all right, thank you. I bet it's the poor people and the people of color. What are you gonna do about fixing the problem? So that is kind of the mentality. So if you're gonna write a grant, aim two or aim three need to have some intervention to try to drive or at least develop an understanding on how the portfolio or the CQI can drive change in the state of Michigan. So kind of, Doing research for the sake of developing kind of new knowledge is admired, but I think you kind of, as a researcher, need to be need to be bringing more to the table, or at least a compelling narrative on how this is foundational to really improve people's lives. Another piece of advice, I've seen this happen. I try to count at least ten times in the last year because frequently people reach out to me. I'm interested in this, and I'll say, "All right, you should talk to so and so." Um, you know, kind of. Don't, in, don't initiate the conversation like a bull in the china shop and don't be too professorial about things. Um, these are, CQIs are businesses and they um, are, um, many of them are very excited to, to um, partner to do research, but um, just kind of uh, don't bring too much technical stuff to the table and, um, just kind of start slow. So I'm gonna highlight really probably the most fulfilling kind of professional partnership of my personal career, not to talk too much about myself, but it is, I think, been a um, uniquely successful partnership between real scientists and, uh, and the CQI. So, you know, I think five years ago in the hallway, I mentioned this opioid epidemic seems like a real thing to Chad and, we, um, and then uh, we kind of have created this, um, you know, mission, this open group that is pretty robust and kind of, it worked so remarkably well because you know, um, Chad is like the driving force um, behind, and he's, has a, has a painfully scientific mind. I tell him that all the time. And Jen can, can make us, she can take our silly ideas and make them remarkably fundable and 10 times better. And then I can provide the platform. So I can say, oh, here's all the hospitals, here's all the doctors um, and kind of provide the influence. And it's been kind of fruitful for a hundred reasons. But one is it's never only been about research, but there's been a lot of research that have, have used this kind of relationship. And this is just kind of something I pulled off of, uh, um, I don't know, some old grant that Chad and Jen or I had submitted, but you can kind of see just these are a couple of the research grants and there's gotta be Chad and Jen must have 20 grants using um, um, improving kind of opioid prescribing and substance use disorder in the state of Michigan. Um, and then, you know, like Jennifer Meddings has an awesome grant within the surgery collaborative around, you know, um, urinary catheter use. Justin Dimmick has one around, you know, um, lap colectomy. Um, and there are many, many, many more. So, you know, this is this slide shows kind of really amazing work that happened within the surgical collaborative in partnership with open. And really what the problem was, was over prescribing. We started off writing some papers using registry data and national data to really understand the problem. And then Chad and Jen designed essentially an intervention that we did across the state of Michigan. And they helped the collaborative identify that you really need to get in, you know, be following patient board outcomes. So we get patient board outcomes on tens of thousands of people in the state. And um, they informed the QI uh, and, and we've had kind of remarkable success. So this is just um, the, the gray line or the, 
kind of, I think the states touching Michigan plus maybe Kentucky, and this is the kind of prescription size after surgery, and this is the state of Michigan. So many, lots of foundational research work. Um, I think my five most kind of reference papers are things Chatter Jen wrote around opioids or Ryan Howard or someone smarter than me. Um, so lots of great foundational research work, lots of grants, but also we fix the problem. And I think that is kind of the, the, you know, the slam dunk relationship. Um, and it continues, you know, the problem is, I guess, isn't fixed. We fixed one part of a really complicated problem. So um, that's, I think, how it can be kind of, quote, at its best. And there are many similar kind of relationships across the CQIs. I just really only know about the one I've been involved in. Um, so anyway, I want to talk about the platform a little bit uh, with respect to education. So um, many, you know, within our organization, we're very lucky we have, you know, so many fellows, trainees, medical students who um, kind of make all of us better. And I think the CQI data, the CQI space is, is really well suited for them for lots of reasons. Um, one is that the data is relatively approachable. So like all of the colectomies in the state of Michigan are a lot simpler than all the colectomies from a Medicare data set across the United States. So the uh, data can be approachable if you're doing analytic work. Um, and then I think they can kind of see a potential impact. Um, and, you know, many of, uh, many students and many residents, if you look at the, you know, papers and, and abstracts uh, that are used, the platform, the majority are written by trainees. Um, and I know how much we all love, um, you know, mentoring these trainees. So um, it's a unique opportunity, I think, for education. And this is just, you know, I think this is a conceptual model from uh, Ryan Howard, one of the trainees that, you um, where he thinks about kind of like, you know, the pe people come to see a surgeon, they have comorbidities, behaviors, and they have attitudes and beliefs, and they leave with a surgical problem fixed, but they have the same comorbidities, behaviors, and attitudes and beliefs. And he, he's kind of really developed this kind of conceptual model around kind of the teachable moment and trying to do kind of preventative health interventions at the time of kind of a surgical episode. And, you know, I think I put this up here because this is work that we're, we're um, this is a conceptual model that Ryan will bring to his K award, to his R1s. And he, I think, understands how there's, he can do hardcore research on this. He could do quality improvement on this and really potentially have an impact um, in the state of Michigan with this kind of con conceptual model. And he's done all of this um, by writing you know, lots of papers and engaging within the portfolio. And I think he kind of sees the portfolio as potentially an obvious next step in his professional development. And that's kind of really, you know, I think the a best possible outcome from, from research within the portfolio. So I just have a couple more slides. I wanted to talk about how the portfolio is pivoting a bit, or not really pivoting, but expanding into more kind of foundational health, um, community-based health care and chronic, um, chronic disease management. So and I like to say that, you know, Michigan is a great place for a liver transplant, but a bad place for a diabetic. And I guarantee you, if you needed a liver transplant, look at Jamie Miners right now. If Jamie needed a liver transplant, it's what time? 4.30, clinic closes at 5. We would get her in by 5. <laughs> if Jamie Myers is a newly diagnosed diabetic, good luck, you know. So my point being is that the system is set up for um, kind of, uh, kind of certain types of care and there's gaps for others. And diabetes is just one example, um, but we're trying to get into the space of kind of the foundational health that really causes figures like this to exist. So this is, many of you probably seen data like this, but survival in the state, in the United States kind of is lagging other countries, despite the fact that we obviously know we spend so much money on it. And because we spend a lot of money on healthcare, we don't spend a lot of money on improving health. And we're trying to use our precious resources to get into the improving health business in the state of Michigan. So what are we excited to do across the portfolio? Well, I can't speak for you of the program directors. There's, you know, probably 50 program directors. There's each, each program has a director and a associate director. And I, I can't, I lead the portfolio, but it's a, it's a loose federation at best. Um, and, you know, um, if you want to engage with uh, um, a, one of the CQIs, you need to talk to their program director. And I'll talk about that in a second. But these are, um, I think, unique opportunities um, or places where we don't, do enough work. 
Um, nursing care is a perfect example. Like most of the care is done by nurses, but I don't think we have any grants on nursing care across the, the portfolio. Um, and I won't read out the rest of them. So these are just ideas I kind of came up with um, and certainly doesn't, uh, isn't limited to that. Sorry, I'm on, uh, I'm on call because, you know, someone wants to come to the clinic at five o'clock, Jamie Myers and get their liver transplant. So I have to be available. So um, just one slide on this, because this is the statewide data hub. And um, this will be an, a remarkable resource for all of us um, if we can build it. So it does not exist. Um, and I won't go through this in detail, but I'll just say this. We aspire to develop um, an all payer, all claims based, um, and also EHR kind of in, informed um, kind of statewide data hub for everyone in the state of Michigan, where we can not only look at an episode of care, but look at people's lives. And this will be, you know, a, a long journey. We just started about a year ago and we've had some, you know, we're 1% of the way there with diabetes care for Blue Cross patients in the state of Michigan. And even that has limitations. So um, I don't know what the future of this will be, but um, you can imagine what a remarkable resource this could be. Um, and if you're interested more in this, then you can reach out to me because we probably need your help. So if you have a research idea, here's some advice. So, um, you know, Jen, I think wrote an R01 early in our opioid kind of work together across the CQIs. And I think, um, uh, and it was, you know, it's, it's kind of like hard, hardcore research idea. Um, and I think the most effective thing like Jen was able to do for Chad and I is convince us that her ideas were our ideas, meaning like she kind of needed me to use the platform. So, um, you know, partner with the people who the CQI directors and bring them in as kind of full partners in the science. I think that's kind of step one. Um, and here's an analogy that may fall flat, but I'm going to kind of give this a go. So um, imagine you run a CQI and actually imagine you own a Starbucks, okay? Um, and two different groups of people come and they wanna like sell stuff like outside of your Starbucks. One are the Girl Scouts and the other one is this guy in a fruit stand. Um, who are you gonna say, sure, you can sell stuff outside of my Starbucks? Um, I suspect you'll pick the Girl Scouts because one is they're Girl Scouts. So there's a compelling narrative to support them. Two is that cookies go pretty well with coffee. So the business is aligned pretty well. Um, and then three is, you know, it's kind of like a short term kind of relationship. You're like, all right, they're Girl Scout season, you know, so we'll do this thing. And then, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's not a huge commitment. I suppose that the guy in the fruit stand, and I'll stop with the analogy because you can kind of see where I'm going with this. So if, uh, if you are a CQI, you're like the Starbucks owner. If you're a scientist, you're like someone who wants to kind of sell their stuff in their store. And that must be done strategically and things have to align. Um, you can't just kind of use their infrastructure um, because the infrastructure is paid for to do quality improvement, not research. So it has to be done um, with care. How did that analogy go? Um, along those lines, these are um, data organizations. And within that context, they have um, rigorous protocols around um, kind of data management and collaborations. And this is just one that I, uh, Mark Bradshaw um, sent to me from the Michigan Value Collaborative. But you can see here, they have a process. There's no one single process. There's no one blanket IRB. Um, and you have to kind of engage in the process. And most of these CQIs will have like a research kind of committee. Sometimes Blue Cross who funds a lot of this work is also involved in that. Um, and you kind of have to um, kind of kind of go through it and follow it to the letter of the law. So I think I just wanted to put, um, say who, what the CQIs are again, and I think I'm done, yeah. Um, because if you do have an idea, I suggest as the next step is you reach out to the CQI director. Um, and you um, um, just kind of have a meeting, a Zoom call or coffee, and you try to understand what they do, what their business is, 
and then potentially share kind of what some of your interests are. So Aspire is anesthesia. So that, you know, Sasha and Ketterpaw, they're off Shaw would be people we reach out to. BMC2, as I said, is cardio, cardiovascular interventions and both structural heart, vascular surgery, kind of coronary interventions. So Drs. Groom, Hankey, and Grossman run those organizations. Um, HMS hospital-based care, Scott Flanders runs that. Um, uh, impact is about transitions to care. So that the journey kind of from hospital-based care to potentially nursing home and outpatient-based care. So Grace Jenk runs that organization. Mackey is around kind of safe anti, uh, anticoagulation care in the state of Michigan. So Jeff Barnes and Jim Fralick. Uh, Marquis is around total hip and total knee. Um, and Richard Hughes and Brian Hallstrom run that. Michigan Bariatric Surgical Collaborative, MBSC, Amir Ghaffari runs. Um, medic uh, is around emergency medicine. Keith Coker and Michelle Napaver run the Moxie is around oncologic care. So generally non-surgical oncologic care. I think Moxie is actually our biggest um, collaborative now that I think about it. And as you can imagine, because there's a lot of cancer in the state of Michigan and Jennifer Griggs uh, runs that. M Rock is radiation oncology. So Lori Pierce and Jim Heyman run that. The MSQC is surgical care. Um, Sam Hendren and I run that. Missick um, is based in Henry Ford, spine surgery. Jason Schaub and a couple of his uh, colleagues at Henry Ford run that. Um, uh, MSTCVS, cardiothoracic surgery. Rich Prager, um, Frank Bagani, and I put Donnie's name in there because he uh, um, has done a lot of research collaboration with them and is a QI leader also in addition to an established researcher. MT equip is trauma surgery. Mark Kemmler runs that. Music is urologic care. Christian Ghani runs that. The Michigan Value Collaborative uh, is the, essentially the, um, the kind of overarching value CQI across the entire portfolio. And Harry Nathan runs that. OBI is around um, women's health, but particularly focusing on appropriate use of cesarean section. Um, Lisa Langan and Lisa Lowe and Elizabeth Langan run that. So if you have an idea or you want to learn more, um, I'm happy to meet with anyone. Um, some of those CQIs have um, a long history of kind of research collaborations. Other ones don't. Some of them have regulatory challenges that make it easier or harder to kind of do what you think you might want to do. Um, the, some of the best work is policy-based. Some of it is implementation science. Um, but many, many, many options. And I encourage you to reach out to those program directors or myself if you have any additional questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, do people have questions? Um, I'll ask a question while I'm waiting to see if people put some in the chat. Um, can you give some advice on with regard to the time frame for approaching a CQI like prior to a grant submission? Um, you know, you talked about really co a collaboration and not just a, hey, can you write a support letter so I can come in and do this project? And like, what's a good time frame to kind of be thinking about setting that up? I think it probably, it's a great question. Um, it probably depends on the nature of your relationship. So I actually just looked preparing this for the last, cycle and I don't know when it was, but in the spring, I wrote 13 letters of support for various grants, which wasn't, you know, wasn't any work. Um, my point is like a lot of people submit a lot of grants within the portfolio. Um, and some of like, you know, Dana Tellum and I have been working on stuff all along. So if Dana says, hey, it's due tomorrow. Can you write this letter? And hey, you know, um, then that's, she and I've had a long-term relationship. It's not a big deal. So that doesn't bother me. That being said, if it's a new partnership, I think you need six months. I really do, because you really need to understand the collaborative and what they can bring to the table. And they can't just do research work. So they have a statement of work and it's for quality improvement. It's funded by, for, by clinical dollars, just as any researcher knows, like you can't use clinical dollars to do research, right? Research needs research dollars. It's not, I'm not saying that there can't be essentially an overlap where the quality improvement work provides research data but there's a lot of nuance and a lot of discussions and a lot of regulatory stuff that needs to be managed. Um, so I think six months is a reasonable courtship, so to speak, and start small. So go out to coffee. Don't first date, you shouldn't go to Petoskey, right? Go get coffee, 
and work your way up, have multiple meetings, and uh, you'll get a sense pretty quickly whether um, the, um, the CQI is going to be a good partner or not. Thank you. Um, we have another question uh, from Toby Lewis. Can you help clarify the thinking about discriminating QI activities from research intervention? Many times they're intertwined. It's a really good question. Can you? Yeah, um, I could talk. I could give an entire talk about this, but I think it's about intentionality. And I think it's about, and it's at the discretion of the CQI program director because it's her or his kind of group that is doing this. But if your intention is improving care straight up, then um, that is quality improvement. If your intention is developing new knowledge, that is research. And I know that sounds like an oversimplification, but we have an IRB and you write one and they will tell you how regulated it is or not. Different CQIs have different approaches to IRBs across their portfolio or not. Um, they, there could be situations where you have to get consent from every individual surgeon or patient that you engage with, potentially not. So, um, and I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. And. Um, Feel free to add on to questions if folks have them. I, I can't as much see if people are raising their hand or anything. So um, yeah, just keep typing them on in. Um, John actually asked about the IRB process and how does um, how does the process for IRB review, John and Ian, um, and that for Blue Cross Blue Shield review, if a researcher and a CQI team would like to work together. Um, and you mentioned a little bit that it can vary, but um, especially if we're thinking about like intervention studies or trials where we now have to identify like a central IRB. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Or I don't know if there's any direct separate directors of CQIs that wanna to speak to this on their own um, process. That would be really helpful. Yeah, I mean, let me look for someone to rescue me here. Um... I know a little bit about how it works with Moxie because that's the one I've worked with the most. And I don't know if Dr. Griggs is on the on this, um, but I would love to hear how, and it's and it, it can be variable. So some of the sites within Moxie, um, I mean, obviously everybody needs to cede to a central IRB for a clinical trial, which would be the Michigan IRB, but um, then there can be some separate IRB work that needs to be done with separate sites and groups as well. I mean, I think uh, I'll start and then Donnie, I may put you on the spot here because you've done a lot of complexity, I know, and, and frustrations. Um, how about this? It isn't easy. You have to follow the rules. Um, start off by writing an IRB within your own organization. Um, if it requires an IRB um, at the other sites, because if you're just doing kind of like policy analysis, then you don't really need it um, with the identified data. But if you're going to change antibiotic dosing at Munson Hospital, then you, bet, you, you definitely do. Um, and you have to kind of negotiate that. Generally, most of these sites, you know, they will rely on the University of Michigan IRB, but will have their own kind of process to review them. Some of the other kind of more established kind of multi, you know, kind of the big health systems will have their own separate IRB. Um, I will say that is where like the portfolio staff can be super helpful because they know, you know, Nancy works at Munson. And when we have these questions, she's their office of general counsel like person and we go right to Nancy. So that's why the long, that six month kind of lag time is really important. Um, but, it, you know, sometimes it's really easy to be honest and other times, it, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of work that you have to do. Donnie, can I put you on the spot? Cause I know you've done, you and, and, Sachin and Nirav and Jennifer Griggs come to mind as the people who've probably done the most of this kind of more intervention-based stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I used to have really thick hair and you can see what happens when regulatory issues come up. Um, I do think that there's probably not one rule or not one approach. And I think it's important to understand that the contracts across different institutions for different CQIs are different. And so having a one size fits all probably is not um, feasible 
I think what's most important is to understand from the CQIs what their portfolio is, what their contracts and regulatory environment is. And some projects probably are off the table and it's maybe more efficient to actually do the work in establishing DUAs uh, with individual centers than perhaps doing it through the CQI just because of the regulatory environment. So my suggestion would be for, for people interested in a topic to get to know the CQI, understand what their interests are and where there may be overlapping interests. And then once you get beyond that set of conversations, try to understand what some of the barriers and facilitators are. And those would include you know, the regulatory environment, which is complex, it's not easy, and I think it's also um, humbling. <laughs> That's just my honest uh, thought here. And I know Mike and I and uh, Patty Torrier from our, you know, our um, MSTCVS QC group have talked about this at length. And I also think having a conversation uh, as it unfolds with the IRB with and in conjunction with um, the CQIs is important and also the Office of Legal Counsel because they don't always talk. Yeah, thank you. I will say though, just to counter Donnie's uh, alopecia argument, um, the you can do some amazing things like cluster, this is the right. unmatched kind of domain for cluster randomized trials and you know changing practices kind of um, at the bedside. So it can be done. Um, but, uh, and I think even one or two projects have been randomized, but just for QI, they haven't really been researched. Um, so many innovative things can be done. I'll say like Donnie, uh, our friends at Aspire have a lot of experience with this, Jennifer Griggs, I'm sure. Um, but it's hard to, you just kind of have to go through the process. And it really, a lot of it depends on the nature of what the intervention is gonna be and how many patients are gonna be involved and things like that. Yeah, um, and there's some great tips kind of coming up in the chat too from folks who have done some of this. Um, I wanna go back up to Raj Mangrukar asked a question, um, uh, veering from the IRB topic a little bit, how much is the parent organization Blue Cross involved in determining initiatives to be folded into the CQI or is the discretion much more at the director level? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Generally, Blue Cross is hands off regarding the QI agenda. I'd say generally, I'd say they're 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 hands off. So what does that mean? So if the cardiac surgeons want to work on, they're doing this thing with pump sucker kind of something. I don't know. I don't know what it is. You have to be a cardiac surgeon to know. That's obviously something only a cardiac surgeon would know and love. Um, so uh, so they set that agenda. Some CQIs have like a executive committee and they review data and they say, where are the gaps? These are, this is our, these are our priorities. Sometimes it's done just by the program leadership. Um, in the MSQC, we're working on hernia, colorectal cancer, and smoking. Like that's our agenda for the next coming year. Blue Cross um, really does let um, the programs set their own agenda. Blue Cross does decide what new programs get funded. So for example, um, you know, lung disease or diabetes care is a big kind of challenge for them. So, um, you know, that we set up a new collaborative in those domains. I don't know if that answers your question, Dean Raj, but uh, they're pretty hands off because they know very much that, you know, it's always like, I always say the orthopedic surgeons only listen to orthopedic surgeons about orthopedic surgery, so. He says, yes. And also has another question of how often are non-physicians um, other health professionals involved in leading initiatives within CQI? Um, uh, <laughs> probably not at all, to be honest. Each CQI has a physician director. Um, occasionally, it's been a nurse in leadership roles. Um, sometimes technical people like radiation oncologists have these physicists or something. I don't, I don't totally understand it. Um, there are some PhDs. So Richard Hughes runs Marquis. He's a PhD engineer, along with Brian Hallstrom, who's a physician. Um, yeah, uh, but generally it has a physician leader. Some CQIs do an admirable job with engaging patients 
um, at the table. Jennifer Griggs' CQI comes to mind in cancer care um, and other kind of advocates for specific problems. But generally the, um, I don't know if you know this, but healthcare is a business and um, uh, a lot of the, the QI agenda, you know, is generally set by physicians for physicians. Um, but certainly um, there are many opportunities for uh, kind of non-physicians to engage, particularly in the research side of things, but certainly in the leadership side. There you go. So Elizabeth said HMS has a multidisciplinary involvement with pharmacists and, and kind of a specialist in vascular access. So, um, so yeah. I'll say, you know, 300 people and uh, a robust portfolio, 350 people, I think. And there is, um, uh, there's a lot of diversity across the group. I will say, you know, as I was reviewing for this, one big, I looked at the grants, the grants I last, none of them had anything to do with nursing care. So I don't know if there's anyone from the School of Nursing, but that's got to be an untapped kind of resource because there's, you know, tens of thousands of nurses across the portfolio and doing a lot of QI, you kind of realize that so much of it is, is related to, to, you know, inform, you know, engaging with nursing nurses to understand what patients really need. So there's a huge, I think, gap there across our portfolio. And some of our really best work has started from a research idea. So I, I couldn't say that's my talk, but like, this, you know, Donnie Lukoski has a research idea in cardiothoracic surgery. He writes some papers. It's like, oh, this is evident. This is really best care. It changes practice. The CQI changes that practice. Like that's the holy grail. But so this, there's a huge role for research to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, so uh, it's an exciting opportunity. Now Donnie says working in the CQIs is so fulfilling. But though though it's apparently you've lost your wild your manes of hair. No, but you know. I not everything that is um, challenging shouldn't be done, right? And, uh, you know, a lot of our work now involves cross CQI work and it adds to the diversity of the perspective It adds, you know, to, you know, the, I guess it, it that's necessary given the complexity in which care is provided. And it's, you know, people are wonderful, right? Michigan's a wonderful place to work and thrive and, um, people, you know, uh, really benefit on the ground from, from the work that we do. Well, um, that might be an excellent note on which to wrap up. Um, I see a lot of comments coming through. Um, so if folks are having a chance to kind of read some of those, people are offering some <laughs> ideas and thoughts. Um, apologies for the barking. I know one of the things that we like to do at the end of these is go off into breakout rooms. And so if you can stay on, um, Shelly, uh, Stacy will be putting us all into some small breakout rooms for a few minutes. And so some of the conversation can continue. Um, probably time for one more question if anyone has one. Otherwise, we can start the breakout room process. Not required, but it's really a lot of fun um, to go in for a five to 10 minutes and chat with colleagues about issues that came up on the presentation. Or I have other. one editorial correction though. So Lisa Kinglow leads OBI and she is, I think, a Dean at the School of Nursing and she is a um, nurse midwife, I believe by training. Um, so I guess uh, I missed that, so. Great. Well, we had a great turnout, um, lots of interest, obviously. So folks, please continue to um, follow up with the program leaders for each of the CQIs and um, stay on if you can and go on into the breakout rooms and continue the conversation. And sorry again for the barking. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mike. <laughs>